spawn. And Vettius, where have you been all day? Welcome to World. <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment, Jet. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm here for, and I'm ready to break down everything that's happened. I can't believe you put a suit on for this. Like, I was standing next to Ender all day, and he didn't have a suit on, and then you show up to the post game, and you have a suit on. That's yeah. impressive. That's dedication. You're yeah. welcome. Shows maturity, really. <laughs> is what you're trying to do. <laughs> Uh, want to touch on that last game. The Oppo player of the game goes to Humanoid for his LeBlanc performance. What do you guys think of that game? Uh, I thought that it was great to see from him during the regular season. Uh, he did have a fantastic performance. He was one of the best performing mid laners during the regular season. And he showcased that he could be one of the big carries for the team and some uh, an X factor that could be introduced into a splice lineup that never really had that before. And I think that with his LeBlanc performance today, we got to see an element of that where he was three levels up against both enemy carries and he really controlled uh, the vast majority of the game. Yeah, and I think it also showed that Splice is really comfortable playing around these assassin picks, something that maybe I wasn't as confident in because so many times he just went for the chunks. There was no follow-up. It's like, okay, if I get this, then we can just set up for an objective. We can take yeah. another Infernal Trick. Sure. We control the pace of the game. You know, I'll go for a chunk on mid lane. That means there's no bottom lane plays that can be made because we can always have superior numbers down there despite a teleport advantage coming through for the Isaris gaming lineup. So I just like the composure that Humanoid showed with his lead. Yeah, I think specifically if Splice is able to use more Assassin picks like that, it actually bridges them mm -hmm. to late game where Kabe is going to be so successful, which I think will be really useful for them throughout the group. But uh, throughout the rest of the day, we saw the day start off with a big bang, basically. Clutch losing to YOL. But then we saw comebacks fly back when YOL then lost to Mammoth. I'm going to have to ask you why Mammoth's tricode is MMM at some point. Uh, <laughs> said, like, Where's the third, what's the third M doing in there? Uh, but the rest of it, uh, I asked you before, like, if you could describe this day in one word, what would the word be? My word would be nervous, to be honest. To okay. Start this day. Do you want to know why? Or <laughs> what yeah, normally you explain why after you <laughs> yeah, do the work. Okay, uh, so the reason I say nervous is because I think there have been more uncharacteristic, unforced errors in this day of League of Legends, with the exception of Splice, than any international tournament I have personally ever seen. Well, Fair enough. Videos? Uh Mine was fun. Um, <laughs> I thought it was a lot of fun watching today. I had a lot of fun watching Clutch lose. Uh, I had a lot of fun watching the Nocta admit, even if his build is terrible. Um, I had a lot of fun. You build? Lethality. Okay. He should be played as an assassin if you're running him in the mid lane. There are some alternatives, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, I, I actually just thought like, I agree with you that there was like a lot of mistakes, but I also just felt that that made it a lot of fun to watch. Um, yeah, and it true. also creates uh, an interesting dynamic, especially when we look at Group A. Yeah, I mean, looking at the highlights here from the Mammoth versus UOL game, there were three moments where oh, Mammoth yeah. like greatly overreached. Yeah. And I think I said in the cast, like, I'm waiting for the fourth because that would be a tilter. <laughs> and then luckily for them, uh, the fourth one never happened. So what's your word? You didn't include a word. That's not part of the game. I kind of knew you were going to ask me this one. Uh, before we came on camera, I asked what Vettius' word was, and he said, Medi I have one that's <laughs> mediocre. And I'm like, you can't tell me the word beforehand. <laughs> yeah. uh, mediocre is not that bad of a word. Like, I was expecting, um, I think, I was expecting to see a Yumi if it dro is dropped through for one. So, like, my pick and ban stuff was a little weird. And I, I was kind of surprised how many teams seemed to change what they were good at for no apparent reason. Like, Clutch pulling out Renekton in game one, I didn't like. I liked it more when they pulled back in their second game and played more late game scaling stuff, which is how they actually beat most of the below average teams in the LCS. Uh, and then kind of as the day did go on, I did feel like there were almost more mistakes. And maybe that's just like my caster goggles being on, thinking the games I cast were like exciting and not as many mistakes. And then when I'm sitting on the backside, I thought I saw a few too many mistakes in the final three games. Uh, I also think we saw I think a lot of today was, what was that draft? What do you think they were trying to do with that draft? Yeah. What do you think? And yeah. A part of it is uh, New World's meta. Uh, I mean, we, we have a whole section dedicated to this, talking about like the Echo priority, like the Renekton first pick. Uh, and I think drafts are something that didn't help because it also didn't give these teams a lot of options. So often you're forced into this awkward situation where you have to make something happen with very few tools to do it. Uh, and so I hope that as the planes progresses and as the Worlds progresses, teams will have a better understanding of like, what is the World's meta? What are the best picks to prioritize and how can you set yourself up for success? And I find this sometimes happens where there is a high priority or a priority on individual lane matchups mm -hmm. that the game starts and you're like, okay, I have a winning lane or I have a lo losing yeah. lane. I understand how to play this. But because there's been three patches, 
Then four people show up on a lane and you're like, I kind of don't know how to play with an echo and why am I going to run echo mid for the first time ever? And it's kind of when it all tries to fit together that you end yeah. up with like these franking comps because you're just picking so heavily for laning phase. And I feel like that did happen a couple of times. Yeah, today. we're going to get into meta a little bit more in depth later in the show. Right now, I wanted to pull up the standings after day one to see how group A and group B are actually shaking out. There was a three-way tie for first, second, or third, depending on how you look at it, in group A between Clutch Gaming oh, and the Unicorns. <laughs> This is alphabetical order. What do you want? I don't, I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> what do you choose? I'll, I'll put the most on M's? Top. I'll put like Mavis on top, for sure. I uh, think they were handily crushed by Clutch, would you not say? Oh, absolutely, but I would say they yeah, but I'd say UOL fairly handily well. Clutch, crushed Clutch. I mean, what I think about this group is what we saw from Clutch at the beginning of the day was... Uh, I believe hubris is a, is a good word, where it felt like that they were just outright better than their opponents, and right. they could take a lot of liberties in how they approached the game. And Unicorns of Love came in prepared. I think that they drafted quite well for what uh, Clutch threw at them. And I think that they were able to handle what seemed to be like a very high pace, aggressive style that you expect from Clutch. But something you were telling me in the break room chat was yep. like during the regular season, the reason why Clutch beat so many teams below them was because they didn't play this style, they actually played the slower style, which then worked much better against Mammoth. Yeah, and DeMonte actually mentioned that in the interview. He gives good interviews where I feel like sometimes he gives away a little bit too much information. <laughs> yeah. He said like, yeah, we had a bad read on the world's meta. We're not going to do Renekton anymore. We're going to pick scalers against teams we think we're better than. But you really did see it reflected from him as well. Just really quick, uh, the other group is Splice 2-0. Uh, all the way down, Isris 1-1, DFM 0-2. Uh, because this group basically went to chalk, which the pool one, pool yep. two, and pool three teams all beating each other in the correct order, I wanted to touch more on what happened in Group A and what that could possibly mean for the rest of the tournament. Because before the day, we were kind of trying to talk about whether or not the major region teams would just stomp through the groups like they usually do. The only major region team to ever not make it to group stage was actually HKA in 2017. They're back, baby. <laughs> They're back. We're going to see them tomorrow. But more importantly, like, does this clutch performance on day one with the loss to UOL and then kind of regrouping for Mammoth, does that make you more or less likely to think that all of the major region teams are going to get through? Hmm. I think that... So I think overall, League of Legends uh, teams have just progressively gotten better year on year. And I do think that the playing teams are slowly getting better, even if we didn't see a lot today. Um, right. But I also just think that in a lot of regions, they're particularly top heavy, which means that the third seeds aren't necessarily competing in the same way that you would expect. And like, we think about Clutch, mm -hmm. their regular season, they barely made it into playoffs. Yeah. A lot of their games went to five games. Think of Splice, they got 0 3 in their first round of playoffs. And like, even though they look very good, like if we just think of NA and EU for the moment, because we haven't seen the other two yet, mm. um, I think that they have not looked as confident as sometimes we've sent play in teams. Like when Europe sent G2 and Fnatic in the past, a lot of people were optimistic and had faith in them because they looked more like the second seeds coming in rather than the third. Really quick though, Spawn, before you get in, last year with G2 and Cloud9, who ended up making deep runs in Worlds, we act the licorice tweet happened that now is infamously memed yes. because G2 lost a group stage game to Supermassive and then Cloud9 went to all five games uh, in their best of five. And G2 actually was 3-1 against Infinity with a comeback in game four. Yep. So like, I felt like last year it was close. But Spawn, uh, yeah, what do you think? I was going to say, I was more interested in like how the games went as opposed to the outcoming results. Okay. And I think what it showed is that you have to play a positive, proactive style and your style versus these teams that should on paper be better than you. I think we saw UOL like, have a really good read and then have a great kind of answer to that. And they took some risks through the jungle position and Anasik was stealing away camps and they gave him a big advantage. And then when uh, Mammoth played against them, they ran like a negative lane versus Huni and then they ran scaling and they seeded all vision and they waited for the clutch mistake to come, mm. maybe expecting a higher tempo game plan. And that's not really how we've seen Mammoth kind of have a really successful last four weeks of the OPL. So I think it just speaks more volumes to like, Play proactive League of Legends. Like, this meta at the moment is all about, you know, getting in people's face, looking for your shot. Don't seed map control. Don't let the game get away from you because it will become scary. And I think that if people do do that, then it opens up kind of, uh, you know, being able to take more opportunities and therefore win more games. It sounds right. stupid when you say yeah. it like that. Well, but it's interesting because I tend to agree with DeMonte and Clutch's sentiment that when you are better than the other team and you both play scaling, yes. 
the better team is more likely to win. So I guess that basically follows the logic of, okay, no one should play scaling against clutch then. Correct. But does that basically mean that any team that is better, you should never play scaling, even if that's what your, your strength of the, as a team is? No, if it is your out and out strength of the team. Like if we go back in the day and, you know, we're talking about like 1,000 yeah. CS, Teddy Laser Fountains, or you're talking about Frog and playing <laughs> an Ibu or something. If that is how your team won domestically, yeah. like, go do that. But Isaris Gaming were very quick. Their acceleration of gold leads, you know, 15 True. to 20 minutes is really quick. Mammoth are a really quick team, especially with Fudge. Like, with Topoon, they're more scaling. With Fudge, they're all about fighters in the top lane. I was expecting to see a Camille come out, and that's just not what we saw today. Yeah, that's right on the topic of the meta that we saw after day one. We had a ton of theories about what was going to happen. We saw six unique regions play today, and at the end of it, we have six 100% pick band champions. Zyra, Khan, Pantheon, Kiana, with Pantheon and Kiana being banned in every single game. Wow. GP and Syndra, five out of six games. Nocturne, Echo, Renekton, and Kai'Sa in four of the six games. Those are your top 10 presents after day one. And it looks like when you look at the win rates, <laughs> it's, it's a little... Uh, <laughs> well, the 0% win yeah. rate on Pantheon yeah, 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 and Kiana is because course, they were never played. Because they were the bans. But even then, like, you look at how much priority is put on Zaya right now and still with only a 50% win rate. Like, obviously, I think that Kai'Sa and Zaya are typically the go-to. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know Spawn, something you thought was quite interesting was, like, the high Tristana presence that we actually saw. Obviously, she's not on the list, but mm -hmm. it was something that... Splice was actually something a big fan of during our regular season here in Europe, um, but it wasn't really something that took Storm, yet it seems to be a little bit more popular on day one. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's the flexibility of being able to play it in solo lanes, and then I always say the one thing you can't buy in League of Legends, even though you can buy it now, is range. <laughs> and range is just such an important tool, especially if you're going to run no frontline, difficult to execute comps. Yeah. Being able to just siege up turrets, you know, we saw a comp today with a Tristana as well as a Heimerdinger and Morgana. Like, how do you ever get on that guy? Like, how, how how many mistakes does a Tristana have to make before you can actually kill that Tristana if you're running like a tankless front line? Yeah, at least three. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something that came to mind, especially when you talk about all these front lineless teams, is how much Echo ended up struggling. So Echo is a new pick for the world's meta, but he was basically the most practiced solo queue jungler coming into this. And just trying to break down the failures we saw out of Echo, so many of them missing their parallel convergence, like actually just not running into it, let alone trying to get the stun, poor alt timings. But I think in almost every Echo situation, they were trying to run it in tankless teams, which I think doesn't necessarily fit. Yeah, sure. But I was just thinking during all of this Echo play, like trying to cast my mind back to when Echo was a mid laner. Yeah. And what he did, and it was he was very good at farming side lanes. And then when he had items, he could just one hit a carry. I yeah. don't ever see how Jungle Echo does either of those things in a competitive match. So then you have to start thinking, okay, is it the turret dives? Well, why are they just not playing Elise? Is it a team fight presence? Then why mm -hmm. are you just not playing Gragas? There are so many better options so do you for the think... walls. He kind of seems like a jack of all trade and absolutely master of no, all, uh, none so far. Do you think after a day of worlds, these teams are going to lower their Echo priority? Okay, that's a different that's a, question. A good than question what right? you're gonna, play, pro players are stubborn, so absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, They're going to keep playing. Do you think yeah. they should? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, coming into Worlds, I think I was one of the casters backstage that was saying, I don't understand this pick. It doesn't farm yeah. quickly. I don't think it has good ganks. You have to bring the CC for Echo to be able to gank. Whenever that is a condition of a winning lane, like I'm just like, sure, why don't you just play any other jungler with it then? Like play Graves or Kindred if that's the condition of a lane. Like I yeah. just, I, I don't actually understand the pick and maybe I'll be proved wrong by a better team. I have a theory that in the scrim and solo queue meta, it has been taking over games, which is making them want Absolutely. to play it in pro. We've all because seen scrims. They the, have like the gold advantage is so faster, but at a slower game, it's looking at least now like it, Kind of sucks. Like, compared to I mean, I think I think if uh, Echo is like the Silas replacement, and that's why I think the equivalent should be, and I think that the expectation would be is while he can know the gank, his whole responsibility should be more towards scaling. And uh, one of my biggest values of Echo is how like he can soak a lot of damage in fights and then reset because mm. you typically build AP. And so like that's how I see him, and that's why I think teams should play him. But that's not how I think teams are currently playing him. So right now, I just think that Echo is being utilized poorly rather than Echo is a bad champion. Okay. Um, so Okay. So you think, because Silas was like, in my opinion, the best team fighting, sure. like without being an initiator, yeah, yeah, a AP jungler in the meta. So that's you think the role. That I think Echo, Echo can played? fill a similar okay. role. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I, I want to yeah. see it. Like this is the thing. I love being proved wrong mm -hmm. about things like this, and maybe it is the degree of difficulty and execution just hasn't been there yet. Uh, I think that in the Mammoth game, 
uh, when it was played. And, like, a lot of those turret dives should have worked. You know, a mm. better team would have killed Fudge at yeah, least yeah. three times in that game. So I do see where it can work. Yeah. Uh, but we've just seen the burden of execution has been too high so far. All right, final pick we got to touch on. I mean, we've got to talk about the Nocturne. Nocturne. <laughs> Four games, it, once yeah, mid. Yeah, so I'm really happy that people are finally recognizing how strong he is. The buffs to his W were actually much more substantial than people give credit for because the amount of raw stats the Nocturne has making very powerful, especially in the early Here game. Comes. That's part of the reason why he can also work in the mid lane, but you have to build him properly. Now, admittedly, they're not losing games because they're building him wrong. <laughs> they're losing games because they picked Nocturne into a comp that was terrible to pick Nocturne mid lane into. <laughs> he is all about diving. He's about threatening the back line. He's, he can be effective in side lanes and skirmishes and roaming as well. <laughs> and they, yeah, they put my face yeah. on uh, uh, but Nocturne mid lane, I think, is something that we may very well see more throughout Worlds, just because I think the AP junglers with Elise, Gragas, and Echo are prevalent in the meta. And I think that we're still yet to see more mages in the bot lane. And with the mm -hmm. likes of those, mm -hmm. AD uh, mid laners are coveted. So things like Yasuo, Kiana, and I think Nocturne can all fall under that pattern. So I thought that it was a good matchup into Rise today because Rise wouldn't be able to shove him in. What other things do you think Nocturne mid can work into that are in the pro mid meta? Like, so, a, you obviously want it with Mage's bot lane and not against yeah, yeah, a bunch yeah. of anti-dive. So, I mean, um, the, gr the best matchups for Nocturne are ones where at six, he can kill you. So things like Orianna can be quite good. Syndra can be quite good. Zoe is by far and away his best matchup. Mm. He also does well into melee matchups. Things like Yasuo and Kiana, he can also play well into. That sounds like a lot of stuff. I mean, Why is not but just also, like, the top like I'm a Nocturne one trick, so my perspective <laughs> might be biased because I play him into everything. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But okay. um, the, one of the big uh, problems that he has is that unlike many other assassins, he doesn't have escape tools. So yeah. you need to have a jungler that's good at playing around him, which is why I don't like him paired with Echo, because <laughs> Echo can't play, like, Echo cannot provide the pressure needed in order to allow um, Nocturne to do what he does, which is hard push in mid, yeah. look to roam, and basically, like, have kill pressure at six. All right, just a hypothetical. I just want to throw out some other junglers that could work with him. What about Gragas? How does Gragas go with Super Nocturne? good, really good. What about Elise? How does Elise also go really with Nocturne? Also really good. Right, cool. I just want to make sure we're covering all the bases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I offer you some unreliable CC? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That doesn't quite work. We're going to see uh, how the meta ends up shaking out tomorrow. That were just some thoughts here. Uh, let's take a look at the schedule we have. We have six new teams from six new regions coming up tomorrow. Group C and D will take to the stage for the first time. And that's a banger of a first match with Royal Youth up I'm against so Damwon I'm so excited Gaming. to see Damwon. I cannot wait. They, they, they messed up their playoffs. And I know a lot of fans at home were like, maybe they just choke on an international yep. stage. But they were incredibly dominant during the regular season. They had an intense best of five against Kingzone to qualify for Worlds. And I've been hearing that this team is looking good behind the scenes. So I'm very excited to see what Damwon can do. Do you know the other best thing about Damwon that I really appreciate is no one can pick their favorite player. Like, you like Canyon. I do like I Canyon. love Showmaker. You know, you talk to Papa Smithy like and it's, it's Noggery. Like. I feel like it's Noggery. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Everyone, everyone has a different yeah. favorite. What? Barrel as well. How like, awful is it with yeah. the team? Like, <laughs> no one likes New Jersey. No, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's how, still four to five. Like, yeah, that's how, not does, bad. how often does that happen, That like, apart from G2, that there's yes. just a player for everyone on Damwon Gaming? That's super cool. Especially from a third seed. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so if you missed any of the action today, be sure to catch our rebroadcast starting at 9 p.m. CEST, which is 12 p.m. Pacific time. And that means it's time for us to log off for the night. So thank you, and we will be back tomorrow for more Worlds 2019. See you then. More Nocturne. Nocturne. Let's go. <laughs> more
the resurrection comes through from his GA. And where Angelus finds the extra kills in the back end. This could be it. He's so big. So much life steal. They still want this fight. It's not going to be the Baron going over, but can they find a team fight is the question. Oh, what? The Baron down the what? Oh, stolen with a point seeker. Rahuni, of course, looking for it. As he dives on oh, him, got another engage coming forward. That's a really great quickness oh. to lock them all up. And King the first to die. That should mean the end of Mammoth. Cannon Barrage is in now as well, but it's not quite enough. Great yes. knock up. That's going to grab Slow for the first kill. Immediately, Saya follows up as Bizachachi gets a huge wall upon it too. Where Angulus, you can't kill her and stick your way out of this one.